Hey guys, Mark Boswell, Boswell Emergency Medical Education, coming at you again with another CEN video short. Today's short clip topic will be a rapid review of our three blood sugar emergencies, the hyperglycemic, specifically the DKA and the HHNK, and then the hypoglycemia. So we'll cover all three blood sugar emergencies, okay? So let's start with the two hyperglycemic episodes. We've got DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis, and HHNK, stands for hyperosmolar, hyperglycemic, non-ketotic coma, HHNKC, um, or S, you may see syndrome. Uh, it's named a few different things by different people, sometimes just HNS, HNK, etc. Um, we'll talk about them, you'll get the point, okay? So, um, the main difference between these two is who needs potassium right away and who can you wait and watch the potassium? And let's talk about why. So DKA typically happens in your type one diabetic. That's the person who's taking insulin injections and they have to have insulin to live. They are truly insulin dependent. If you're not really sure if your patient is truly insulin dependent or they're just using insulin as an augmentation, ask them at what age they started taking insulin shots. Typically your type one patient whose pancreas does not produce enough insulin or possibly insulin absent, started taking insulin shots, injections, and external insulin, usually younger in life, juvenile, childhood, young adult years. These people are actually insulin deficient, okay? They require that external insulin shot to give them insulin without, they would not be able to live. Their pancreas doesn't make as much, okay? The other people, the type twos, also called adult onset or the non-insulin diabetics. The confusing thing with them is some of them do take insulin shots and it's kind of like crazy, like, well, are they really insulin dependent or not? Again, ask this person, when did you start taking insulin shots and were you on other medicines before that? This person probably started taking insulin in their 30s or 40s, usually after they had been started on some oral hypoglycemics like your metformin, glucophage, glucotrol, and the like. And in their case, they're receiving insulin injections to supplement what their body already has. So I'm gonna call the insulin dependent ones type one, I know it's an old school term, and then the non-insulin dependent, the older ones, type twos. Just to make it easier, I'm gonna use the old terminology, all right? You can also think of type ones as insulin absent, and the type twos, as insulin resistant because their body still makes insulin, their cells just don't use it as well um, or very effectively. So DKA is typically the type one or the insulin deficient patient emergency, all right? They go into DKA frequently when they don't take their medication and they get sick typically very quick. Let's face it, your body's not gonna do well for very long with no insulin coming in and that blood sugar building up, okay? So sometimes we have compliance issues, we have patient education issues. Um, we have also patients just like, they don't prioritize taking their medicine. They've got other better things to do. Could also be stress, illness, infection, trauma. Something has affected their body organism to outstrip its metabolic capacity, throws them into DKA, all right? A DKA patient, by definition, diabetic ketoacidosis. If you look at their pH, now you don't have to do a blood gas, okay? Guys, y'all can look at their chemistry panel, their chem seven or basic metabolic. Look at the CO2. CO2 is a direct reflection of their bicarb, all right? If that CO2 is too high, you know CO2 is an acid, you're thinking they're acidotic, okay? If it's too low, you're thinking they're alkaline. So I don't need a blood gas panel on every patient to know if their pH is actually elevated or not. But if you do a blood gas, it is, I'm gonna say the standard that most providers will do to assess for acidosis. You're gonna see that pH will be very low. They will be acidotic and DKA. As you know from other lectures of mine, acidosis is not a good place to be. There's other issues with that. Things don't work as well. Of course, their blood sugar will be elevated in DKA, yeah. They don't have any insulin. They quit taking it or they're not taking enough or whatever, sugar's up. Potassium, I can almost guarantee you more often than not, their potassium, if it's not abnormally high, it will be on the high end of normal. Why is that? 
Hey, it makes simple sense. For that potassium to get out of, the, out of the vessels, out of the circulation, into the cells where it belongs, it requires a potassium pump. Potassium pump needs two things. It needs sugar for fuel. It needs insulin to open the door to let the glucose get in. Does the DKA patient have sugar? Oh, absolutely. Heck yeah. Blood sugar is 300, 400 or more. Do they have the insulin? No. Their potassium pumps have turned off at the point they no longer had insulin. So since they started being sick and becoming acidotic, that potassium level has been rising. The pumps that require this energy to move it have not been working. So they're going to start to have a surplus of potassium in their bloodstream while their blood sugar is up and there's no insulin coming into them. Okay, so DKA, quick review on the labs. Uh, pH will reveal acidosis. Okay, chemistry panel will show acidosis. Blood sugar will be up three, four hundreds, five hundreds maybe. Potassium, either above normal or the high end of normal. Okay. All right. Talked about DK. Let's move to HHNK. Then we'll get to the treatments. All right. So HHNK, HHNS, however you want to call it. That's the type 2 patient, remember? They're not insulin absent. They're insulin deficient. So one of the key points here is their potassium pumps are still working a little. Do they have the two ingredients to run the pump? Yes, they have the glucose. Lord knows they've got the glucose. They've got the sugar. Five, six, seven hundred, something like that. Crazy. Do they have the insulin to let the sugar run the pump? Yes, they do. Their body still makes some native insulin. Remember, type 2, they have inherent native insulin in their body. They just don't have enough or they don't use it well. So they never fully shut down their glucose metabolism. They are still, use, even when they're sick and in trouble, they're still using it a little bit. And they're using it enough that they've not switched to fatty acid metabolism and the resultant release of ketones and ketones cause the acidosis. Sorry about the sun, I'll be out of it in a minute. So they're still, they're not in fatty acid metabolism getting acidotic. So pH normal, glucose up, how about the potassium? What two ingredients run the potassium pump? Glucose and insulin. Do they have the glucose? Yes. Do they have the insulin? Yes, they have some. So those pumps are actually still working some. And therefore, their potassium is not likely to be abnormal at all. It's probably going to be normal, more than likely. All right? So quick review. The two compared, DKA, pH up. I'm sorry, pH is acidotic, which means low. D, uh, HHNK, pH normal. DKA, glucose, could be as little as two or 300 when they start getting in trouble. Typically, the type 2s, the glucose will be much higher. These patients walk around day to day with living with maybe a blood sugar of 300 sometimes. So theirs could probably going to be a lot higher than DKA who gets sicker quicker. All right, potassium, DKA, high end of normal or even a little higher than normal. HHNK, probably within normal range because those potassium pumps are still working. All right, so there's your two etiologies. There's your two lab values we're looking, sets of lab numbers we're looking for. Let's look at treatments. Not too complicated. Both these patients need fluids and insulin, okay? They need fluids because their blood sugar is up and they're in a hyperosmolar state. Both of them are, both DK and HHNK. And that hyperosmolar state is making their blood concentrated and it's pulling water out of the cells to try and dilute this hyperosmolar hyperglycemia that's going on with their elevated blood sugar. Cells, when they give up their water, don't work the way they should. They don't do the right energy, um, the energy production, the mitochondria don't work, their protective mechanisms, all these things don't work like they should. So in a bigger example, um, a cell in your gut, if it's dry and starved of water, your gut cell, it doesn't absorb the nutrients the same way it should in the intestines. It doesn't perfuse the same way it should. The cells are dysfunctional when they're dehydrated. So it's not really that they need volume replacement in their blood vessels to make their blood, their blood vessels fill up. The IV fluids we give them are to restore their cellular water balance. They are in a state of osmotic diuresis and dehydration. So both patients need IV fluids to be started 
rapidly. And sometimes you're seeing these patients just suck up one or two liters of, you know, maybe two liters of fluid just right off the get-go, okay? Almost concurrently with this, even if you're, you know, you're waiting for other lab tests to come back, you've already got your blood sugar, uh, your point of care, your AccuCheck or BGL, finger stick, whatever, it's already high, they need insulin, okay? Obviously, the DKA patient needs insulin because they don't have any the type 2, the insulin deficient or the insulin resistant patient, they've got some. They need more. Both patients need insulin. Okay? For the CE and exam, there's no questions about how much fluid or how much insulin or how to give the insulin. A lot of people kind of get bogged down like, well, the HHNK or the type 2s, we usually give it sub-Q or IV push. Um, the DKA gets the IV pump. It doesn't matter, people. Pump or not, you could put both of them in the pump. And I'm going to tell you, there is some research out there saying you might as well just go ahead and start the type 2 HHNK on a pump as well, too. It makes life easier. You can titrate stuff. Either one. So that's not the test question how to give it. It's just what are you going to give? And let's face it, if you had no more IV pumps in your hospital or had a massive power outage, like I tell classes when I was in Puerto Rico, they had no power, you may have to drip it in with a roller clamp and calculate it. So it does not warrant a pump per se, all right? Potassium, all right, so both patients get fluids, both patients get insulin. You don't need to worry about dosages or amounts or routes. It just needs to be given, okay? Potassium. DKA needs potassium. You're going to start giving it when it's the high end of normal or slightly elevated. Why is that? I mean, that's crazy. So my guy's potassium is 5.6 as I'm starting the insulin. Why am I doing that? Because the two ingredients to run those pumps, glucose and insulin, they already have the glucose. You're starting the insulin. Guess what's going to turn on? Those potassium pumps. They don't, they don't, all of a sudden just light up like that and start dumping the potassium in the cells. They're a little slow and gradual to get started, but once they start running, they're very efficient. They're very good at what they do, as long as they have the two ingredients, the glucose and insulin. So that potassium of 5.6, as you start the first bag of 10 of K, all right? Let's say, you, okay, so you saw a potassium is 5.6 on the chemistry panel. You got an order to give 10 a K. By the time you get that order, by the time the pharmacy prepares it, or you do, or you get it, and you go, you know, do your med checks, verifications, plug it in, get it running, that potassium by now, because you already got the insulin going, could already be 4.8, 4.7, and you're just running this bag of 10 in at whatever it is per hour per your protocol and a chemistry panel an hour later you're like wow we're still going down 4.4 4.2 or some other crazy number like that all right the thing is once you start that insulin on the dka patient and you give them the two tools they need to run their pumps their potassium pumps it's going to start sucking that up immediately out of the blood circulation all right and if you wait until oh my patient's four, 3.8, let's get some potassium. You can't catch that running train fast enough to replace that potassium before you reach the maximum, which is 40 an hour. Granted, central line, 40 an hour, okay? So yeah, we do start potassium early in DKA, usually the high end of normal. HHNK, you can wait and watch that potassium. Why? Because again, do they have the glucose? Yes. Do they have the insulin? Yeah, they still got some. Those pumps are running even before I gave them my insulin. So that those pumps aren't going to suddenly all fire up at once as you give them more insulin. You can you have time to wait and watch and see what that potassium level does. Okay? So review quickly. Treatments for both of these. Both get fluids, both get insulin. No concern about the route, the rate, or the dose. You just know they both need both of those. The difference is who gets potassium. DKA, even when it's high normal. D, uh, HHNK, wait and watch it. Um, that's the nuts and bolts of this, guys. Um, I'm going to cut it here. I did say I was going to do hypoglycemia. I'll save that for another one because I'm already at 15 minutes and I want to make this kind of short for y'all. So I hope I didn't go too fast. 
Uh, of course, um, leave your comments down below. Like, share this with your friends. Talk about it. Um, same stuff we go over in class. So you're getting the benefit of being in class, even though you're not there. Um, if you have been in class, maybe just a little quick little review on the two uh, high blood sugar emergencies for you. Um, let me know how you're doing. Good luck if you're taking the test. Leave your comments down below, and y'all be safe, all right?